Uh, so welcome to Grace. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your presence today. I want to welcome our church online family. Thank you for being with us today. We're glad that you're here. And if you are new, we welcome you as well in Jesus' name. We're glad that you're here. Uh, you know, it, wherever you are at in life, whatever you're experiencing, whatever is going on, whether you're a believer in Jesus or not, whether you have questions, whether things in your life are going great or maybe things are just absolutely sucking right now, I want you to know we're glad that you're here. Today you can meet the King of Kings and the Lord's, Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, and you can know the God, the Creator who created you. So thank you for being with us today. Anybody know the song, I'll Be Home for Christmas? Is it too early to talk about Christmas songs? What, what does the last line say? If only in my dreams, right? Yeah, if only in my dreams. Uh, there's a, that song is kind of a, a song of uh, this is what I'm hoping and picturing it'll be like when we're back together again. But even if it's just my dreams, that's what I'm, I'm hoping for and longing for. In a well-known speech, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speaks of his dream of equality and justice for all. It's a powerful speech. I have a dream, and it paints a beautiful picture of the future that I think we would all want to see become a reality. Believe it or not, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, the men's Olympic basketball team was formed, and it was named the Dream Team because... In the NBA, you'd never get these people together to play, but for the Olympics and for the nation, they gathered together. They joined as a dream team, and they squashed all the competition and absolutely dominated the Olympics 30 years ago. Whew. Anybody feeling old yet? Just wondering. Uh, maybe in your life, you've had a dream about something, and, and, and it has helped to shape who you are, what you do, and who you've become. I know many of you probably had dreams about what life would be like when, when you got out of school, you graduated, you got married, you had kids, and you got older. You had dreams about where you'd be in life, where, where you'd be serving, what you'd be doing, and where you'd be at financially. You had dreams. Dreams are powerful. They speak of potential and possibility. They speak about what could be. They have the power, dreams do, to bring people together, to work for a common purpose, to shape and mold something, to make it a reality. One of the things that I have wrestled, and it is so good to see you today, but one of the things that I have, I don't know if I'm supposed to confess this or not, but I'm just me, okay? One of the things that I have struggled with as a pastor at Grace is a dream for Grace, what is my dream for grace? And I have wrestled with this question. I have prayed about this question. I have sought God about this question. I have had tears about this question. I have gone to conference after conference trying to get this big picture about grace and what it ought to be. When you consider the, the pressure of ministry the shifts in culture that are happening, growth expectations that some people have, the leadership voices that, that changes, the, the wants and expectations of a congregation. And you go and you hear the teaching, this church growth model, this church growth model, this church growth model. And you know, nobody pastors a church. Let me just give you a little hint about a pastor. Nobody goes to a church and goes, I think I can just keep this church really small. Nobody does that. There's not a single pastor that goes and looks at that church and goes, I see this as a small church. Now, this is not a get big church message, okay? I just want to be clear about that. That's not what this message is. But that's at the heart of every pastor. Every pastor goes into a church and has these visions of sugar plums and fairies dancing in their head about what God is going to do at the church. And when, when it all comes around and it, it's, it's not happening, it becomes a dream conundrum. In fact, many pastors become so disillusioned and disappointed that they actually walk away from ministry. They walk away from being pastors, and that's happening in really large numbers even now as we speak. COVID not only impacted people like that, but I'm telling you as a pastor, it has impacted pastors. I have friends that have stepped away from ministry because of what happened during COVID, because of the strife happening in our nation, because of the political mess, the racial tensions and everything that was going on, and what they dreamed for the church and what they saw 
were so opposite that they became disillusioned, brokenhearted, and walked away. A short time ago, I shared with you a message. I say a short time ago. As you get older, those times that get further away just seem not too long ago. I don't know if you've noticed that. But a short time ago, I shared with you a message that, that, that God brought me back to, 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 to a real simple reality that, that involved two things. And the first was this, that we are servants. You remember this? We are servants. That's what we are. We are all servants. If we are, belong to Christ, we are servants. And the second thing, which ties into the first, is this, that because we are servants, the second thing, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about Him. It's not about us. And, and as I was thinking about uh, the church, and I've been thinking about this for some time now, uh, I was reminded of a simple reality about the church that I want to share with you today. It's found in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and it says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Let me pause here for a moment because a lot of people have read this, or I should say some. Some people have read this and they go, see, this is the way the church is supposed to be. Everybody's supposed to sell what they own and give it away. Well, that's not what this scripture is saying. This is, and some people have tried to say Jesus was a socialist and that's the way the early church was. Wrong. That's not true. I'm not saying the church was capitalist, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but I'm telling you it was not a socialist organization. What happened here was not because somebody made it happen. It happened because of what God had done in their hearts and lives. It was a special moment. 3,000 people at one time came to faith in Jesus, and they had to be discipled, so there were a lot of needs. And so people were so happy, so glad with what God had done and what God was doing that they did what they needed to do to help meet the needs of the day. It had nothing to do with socialism or being a socialist club. It was meeting the needs. There was a generosity that flowed because of the gladness of the Lord. And by the way, they still had their homes because they met in their homes. Okay, so every day they continued to meet together. Anybody with me yet? <laughs> Everybody, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. See? And ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added daily, or to their number daily, those who were being saved. This is Luke's commentary. The book of Acts, the letter of Acts, is actually a, a short history, concise history, of the early church with Peter. And, and it follows largely Peter at the beginning, and then it follows Paul, and, and, and it follows that history there. And so we have a uh, kind of a historical account of the early church that Luke writes. Luke also wrote the Gospel of Luke. Now, some scholars and some commentaries say that this view of the church that I've just read, it sounds very nice, doesn't it? It sounds really good, doesn't it? Some say that it is an idealistic view of the church, that it glosses over the imperfections and it simply paints a portrait of an ideal church, a, a dream church, what a church ought to be. Maybe. I guess that's true in some ways because when you read into Acts a little more, you find that the church starts having some problems. How many know churches have problems? Do you know why? Because churches have people. And people, I'm speaking for myself, I wouldn't dare speak for you on this, but people can be problems sometimes, can't they? Yes, we, because we're not perfect. We, we get upset, we get angry, we get disjointed and we get frustrated so it happens the church is not perfect so it's painting an ideal and when you read the new testament most of the letters that are written actually deal with problems in the church but i want you to know that as i read this passage in acts chapter 2 it reminds me of my experience growing up as a young christian maybe it was idealistic but it is a picture of an amazing love, devotion, generosity, togetherness, and unity that is demonstrated in these packed passages. There is awe and wonder at God, at who He is and what He is doing. There is discipleship, there is relationship, there is spiritual growth. And as a pastor, 
everything that I could dream of, in a nutshell, is found in those few verses right there. Everything that I could dream of for Grace Church is found in those verses that I want for you, I want for us, and I want for our community. A little background real quick. It was the day of Pentecost. The the Holy Spirit had been poured out just as Jesus had promised, and He ascended to the Father, thus showing and proof that Christ was resurrected and seated at the right hand of the Father. And then Peter, who denied Jesus now, emboldened by the power of the Holy Spirit, stands up in front of a congregation, a crowd, a crowd of people, and he preaches his first sermon. And about 3,000 people believed that day. And they believed, and they were baptized into Jesus' name. And this is an amazing thing to me, that on the day of Pentecost, the day that the church was born, okay, y'all with me on this? On the day that the church was born, the church gave birth. That's pretty amazing to me. And it's at this point in this historical account of the early church that Luke writes that we find what many call the four marks of the church, at least four things that make up a church. It's not ever less than that, but at least these four things. And I want to share those with you and look at them briefly today. Acts 2.42, it says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, in some translations it says, and to the prayer. Because in the Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in, there is a definite article there. But some translations put to prayer and some say to the prayer. I'll get into that in a little bit and explain why. So they devoted themselves. What comes to mind when you hear the word devoted? Does a song come to mind? Are you hopelessly devoted? I hope that song sticks in your head all day. That's what you get for being at church today. (laughs) Devoted. The Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament says this is what devoted is. To continue to do something with intense effort with the possible implication of despite difficulty. So get that. To devote oneself, to keep on, to persist in, despite difficulty. That's, that's, that's Devotion is what you have in marriage. Because you persist on in spite of difficulties. Right? Devotion is what you have with your children. Because you persist on in spite of difficulties. Amen. I'm moving on. See... Their devotion to one another flowed out of their devotion to Jesus. Because of what Jesus had done, their devotion to Him caused them to look at one another as fellow believers in Christ, and that devotion just overflowed to one another. It wasn't manufactured. It wasn't imposed. It was just a natural thing that happened because of their devotion to Jesus. Because of the things that they had seen, that they had heard and experienced, they devoted themselves to these four things, to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. And I want us to look at these four things, and as as I do, I want to remind you again that this is not something I want from you. This is something that I want for you, I want for us. I want it for our kids. I want it for those who are far away from the Lord. Let's look at the apostles' teaching. You know, there are things which naturally bring us together and serve as the basis for our gathering, and it informs our identity. Let's, let's, let's take this. If you're a Trekkie, any Trekkies here? Okay, I'm see, I've got a few honest people here. See, yeah, thank you. Uh, if you're a Trekkie, you're a Star Trek fan. That's why you're a Trekkie. See, Star Wars fans need not apply. Because you're a Star Trek fan, and that's the basis of your gathering and your identity. Now, we, we'll accept Galaxy Quest 2, but, but other than that, you know, it's, it's, it's Star Trek, right? In, in chess, if you're in a chess club, don't bring back Gammon. Don't bring Texas Hold'em. As good as those games might be, don't bring Parcheesi. Does anybody play Parcheesi anymore? Yes. Okay, we got one person that plays part. I, it just popped into my head. I haven't heard that game. I mean, you know, it's chess, not checkers, right? So don't bring checkers either. It's chess. You come because, and there are organizations that 
feed, clothe, and help people. And their gathering centers around those things. Feeding, clothing, and helping people. Not other things, those things. Well, Christians, believers in Jesus, are brought together around the apostles' teaching. And what did they teach? They taught Jesus. They taught Jesus lived, died, and rose again. They taught that Jesus taught. They taught his teachings about how we ought to live. They proclaimed that he was the Messiah of God who inaugurated the kingdom of God on earth. And not only is he the king of that kingdom, he is the way, the truth, and life into that kingdom. He is the only name whereby men, women, boys, and girls may be saved. That it is in him and him alone that we have the promise of eternal life. My in-laws tell a story of a couple that they met on the mission field. It was a couple serving as missionaries. They're out on the mission field in Africa doing good. (laughs) And this is so unbelievable, but it's true. They went and heard a message. And they said to my in-laws, they said they, they became believers in Jesus serving as missionaries on the mission field because they had never heard the gospel message before. What in the world is the church preaching if... What in the world? I mean, how do, I don't know, but it happened, and it's true. The apostles clearly proclaim that Jesus is both Christ, Messiah, and Lord. And this is what brought the church together, that Jesus is both Christ and Lord. And that is what informs our identity and who we are and who we become. We are Christians. We are not Hindus. We are not Muslims. We are not fill-in-the-blank We are Christians because we are followers of Jesus Christ. Now, there are places, I have to tell you, and I don't want to spend much time, but I do need to make this clear. There are places that have abandoned what would be called apostolic teaching. Their gathering centers around a moralistic message of doing good, and we certainly ought to be people who do good as followers of Jesus. Amen? We ought to be doing good, but... We gather around the fact that that Jesus is the risen Christ who reigns forever. That's why we gather. And if a church is absent the apostolic teaching, it is no longer a church. And it no longer serves as the body of Christ on the earth. And see, doctrine matters. The apostolic teaching matters. What you believe matters. And if you go, well, it's religion, it doesn't really matter what you believe. Is that what you believe? You believe that it doesn't matter what you believe? It doesn't really matter what you believe. It does. And I want to encourage you today to be grounded in truth, to be grounded in Christ. Because there is a lot of teaching that goes on around today that passes as gospel that is nothing more than a self-help, moralistic, therapeutic deism. It isn't the gospel. It sounds like it. It uses gospel terms, but it doesn't have power to save people. So I want this for us at Grace, a devotion to the apostolic teaching, a devotion to Jesus Christ, because it's in Him that we are. We live, we move, we have our being. It is our identity which is found in Him. And listen, when I preach, I just tell you, give you a little heads up, don't just take my word for it. Examine it for yourself. You dig into the Scriptures and see if what I'm saying is true. And if it isn't, you come and talk to me and let me know. And I'll, I'm, listen, I'm willing to learn. But be grounded in the truth. Be grounded in Christ so that there's a lot of that message going around today and you're not tossed to and fro. You're grounded in Christ. I want that for you and I want that for our church. Second thing is the fellowship. What comes to mind when you hear the word fellowship besides Tolkien? All right? What, what a, does the word share come to mind? Share. Share. Not C H E R. <laughs> yeah, share. Intrinsic to fellowship is sharing. And and it's easy when we hear the word share that we think of, of money or something, but that's not what it is. That's not what fellowship is. It is sharing with and in. In the Pillar New Testament commentary, in, in the Acts commentary, 
it says the koinon words, koinonia is the word for fellowship, and there are words that break off of that, koinon. Uh, those words in Greek normally mean to share with someone in something above and beyond the relationship itself. And so it's not just centered on the relationship. There's something that's bringing that relationship together that they are sharing in. Does that make sense? Or to give someone a share in something. Now, here's how this kind of plays out in, in church in, in, when we talk about the fellowship and being devoted to the fellowship. A heart that is healthy looks to share with and to share in. But an unhealthy heart looks simply for what it can get. Today they call it having a consumeristic mindset. It's not what I can give, it's not what I can share, it's what I can get. And I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not talking about genuine needs. We have genuine needs and we are here for one another to support, to love, to encourage, and to help one another. We share in needs. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an unhealthy heart that it's in it for itself. That isn't saying, what can I share, but what can I get? Now think about this for a moment. If this applied to your marriage, what would your marriage look like? What, what, how would your marriage work? Are you ready for this? How, how would your marriage look and work if your attitude was, what can I get out of you? What can you do for me? Hey, what's in this for me? <laughs> how would that work? How would that look? I don't know what you'd have, but it wouldn't be a marriage, right? Y'all are quiet this morning. Did the rain dampen your spirits or something? So, the gospel of Jesus Christ is life-giving. I, I want to I make this point very, very clear here. The gospel of Jesus Christ is life-giving, but this is important. It not only gives us life, it gives us life-giving life. In other words, in Jesus, we have life-giving life. Would you say that in Jesus... Oh, come on, help me out here. In Jesus... I have life-giving life. Say that again. In Jesus, I have life-giving life. Listen, it's not just life, it's life-giving life. Life you keep to yourself, but life-giving life you share with others. Does that make sense? We have life-giving life, and when we are in fellowship, we share with others the life-giving life of Jesus. This is what the early Christians and believers did. They lived out the life-giving life in fellowship with one another by sharing the life that they had received from Christ. And so we receive a life that we are a life-giving life. We're supposed to share it with others. And here's the thing: if you are not sharing, if you are not giving of yourselves, you're not going to experience koinonia. You're not going to experience fellowship. You're not going to experience a deep-rooted community that is centered on Christ. You can't experience deep fellowship standing far away, can you? You got to get close. You got to rub elbows. You got to do life together, right? See, spiritual formation, and this is so important, spiritual formation happens in community. We are made disciples as we live in community because we're sharing in the life giving life of Jesus. Now, understand, fellowship is the fruit of God's grace in our lives that is lived out by the power of the Holy Spirit. We share in this grace that God gives us, and we are united as one because in Christ we are united with the life-giving Father, Son, and Spirit. Their life flows into our lives, and our lives flow into one another. That's what fellowship is. Isn't that beautiful? That God's life flows into us, and then our life flows into one another. How could you not want that? So spiritual formation happens in community. And as we live out the apostles' teachings in community, in fellowship with one another, it begins to shape and form us and transform us into the people of God. And that's why the saying, discipleship happens best in relationship, is so true. And why I want to encourage you today, I hope for you, this deep fellowship. You know, fellowship is connection. And if you feel disconnected at church, 
chances are the reason why is because you are disconnected. And I don't say that to make anybody feel bad, just as an observation, as a reality. If you're feeling disconnected, you're probably disconnected. You're not connected into the fellowship. You, you know, fellowship, not having fellowship is like, it, you know, you got connect the dots. But you're just not connecting the dots. You're not putting them together. Fellowship requires connecting the dots. It means coming together. Fellowship is connection. It's not just milk and cookies, though you can have fellowship over milk and cookies. Anybody like milk and cookies? Mmm, yeah, some good hot chocolate chip cookies. Not the crunchy ones, though. Not crunchy. I want them soft and chewy and, you know, I'm, I'm just telling you. Apologies to my mother-in-law. She loves to bake them really crispy. <laughs> fellowship is devotion to one another. It is sharing in the risen Savior's life together that He has given to us. And I want this for all of us at Grace. So do life together. Do life together. We do is partly when we meet in our large meetings like we are today. You know, the early church met in the temple courts as a large group. They did that. So we have that happening here today. It also happens in smaller settings. They met in homes. They went from home to home and they celebrated the goodness of the Lord. And it can be in our homes. We can meet in homes. We can meet in classrooms here. We can meet at restaurants. We can meet at, uh, on the golf course. There's many kinds of places we can meet. We could grab a cup of coffee and just sit down and, and, and have coffee. Well, no, I won't have coffee, but you can have coffee. And I'll, I'll get a Diet Coke and we'll be good to go. Uh, you can go on a shopping trip together. You can, you can do things together. Hospital visits, a visit in homes helping with someone's need. You can go and help fix a deck. You can help feed the homeless. You can trim bushes or do lawn care or any variety of things, but it's doing it together. Go to a ball game together. Go watch the ball game, uh, you know, no matter how bad the team may be, right? Go watch the ball game and be present and be together. Do it. I've known people that have done this. They've told me, and I've done it myself, with hunting, fishing, and things like that. Just hanging out. We are created to do life together, and without it, we suffer. And Luke then gives a very clear way in which this devotion to the fellowship happens. And I, I like once in a while to use a sermon illustration, so I have a sermon illustration today. And I have to tell you, this bread smells really good. It's fresh, it's soft. But it says that they broke bread. They broke bread. Now, understand it says breaking bread, not breaking bad. If you're breaking bad, come down, we'll pray for you. Breaking bread. Breaking bread. Scholars have debated whether the words breaking bread refer to communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, or whether it's just to a common meal. We do know that around the second century from history that the term breaking bread became a technical term synonymous with the Lord's Supper, with the Eucharist, with communion. But breaking bread originally was just a common way, that thing that was done to initiate a common Jewish meal. The bread would be broken and, the, and then the blessing would be spoken. And you might remember that the scripture says when Jesus was having a meal with the disciples, that he broke the bread and then he blessed it. It's the breaking of bread. And there is something about a meal together that is deeply impacting. A lot of times we go, God, thank you for this food. May it be strength and nourishment to our bodies. Remove all the fat calories and everything else, right? Make it healthy for us. We say that as we eat this cheeseburger that's just gooing over with cheese and anyway that's what we do we go bless this food Jesus and he's like going uh-uh <laughs> I ain't touching that thing <laughs> you know? the breaking of the bread they would break the bread and they would say not just God thank you for this food but in the breaking of the bread, they would go, God, thank you not only for this food. We're grateful for the food, but we're grateful to you because you are the one who has provided. You are the one that has given this to us. You have made this possible. 
that we owe everything to you. We owe our lives to you. We, we recognize as we break the bread that we're eating, but we also remember that, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. God, it's, it's you. You're our source and you're our provider. And you almost have to think that when the disciples would get together and they would break bread, that they would remember that Jesus broke bread and blessed it and said, this is my body, which is for you. My point is simply this that I want you to see. There is something about breaking bread that is redemptive. You see, through meals, Jesus welcomed people, he connected to people, and he shared with people. He, he met with religious leaders, he broke bread with sinners, he broke bread with disciples. And as a result, many people came to believe in him because there's something about meals, there's something redemptive about them. One of the things that we decided quite a few years ago at our house was that we were going to stop sitting in front of the TV and start sitting at the table and having a meal together and have FaceTime together. It may be the only time during the day where we really get a moment to sit and talk and share, but we decided we were going to do that because we used to regularly sit down in front of the TV, watch our favorite episode, stream whatever, and blah, blah, blah. But we decided to do that, and I'm telling you, it was one of the best things that we did, and it has helped to shape our family for the good. We get to catch up, we get to talk, we get to laugh, we get to plan, we get to schedule things, we talk silly stuff. My son and I get in the dumbest arguments sometimes. My wife will say amen to that. We, we talk silly stuff, and when I say arguments, it not only like, Rah! I don't mean that, I'm just, we, we, we talk silly stuff, we talk serious stuff, and it's our time together, and it has been one of our best decisions. And I want to encourage you, church family, break bread with your family, your family at home. Break bread with them. Make time. Take time. It's time well spent. Break bread not only with your family at home, but break bread with your church family. We have meals here together from time to time. We've got one coming up uh, in October. But don't wait till then. Go out now. Listen, just go ask someone out now. Not right now, but I mean at the end of the service, they're like, hey, let's go get a bite to eat. I don't know you, let's go get a bite to eat. And, and what happens when we do that is we initiate something. Conversation happens. Connections grow. Hearts open. Laughter abounds. Needs are shared. Tears are shed. Love is manifest. And Christ is glorified. All through breaking bread. You see, the scripture says that they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were devoted to the breaking of bread. And I want this for us at Grace. Not that you have to, but that you want to. Because of what Christ has done for you. So make an invitation, extend it, ask, open the door, open your hearts. And let's break bread together. And finally, the prayers. And I say the prayers and I'll explain why. The early believers were Jews. They met in the temple. So it's likely that these early believers continued the Jewish practice of prayer, of the prayers that were used in praying at certain established times. And they had a wealth of prayers to pull from. In the Old Testament, there are many prayers that they could pull from and pray. They used the, the psalms in their temple liturgy uh, that, that they would share. And, and I mean, just imagine uh, we would open our service uh, with this. Well, I'm not going to read it all because it, it's, I saw the time. But make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. What a beautiful invitation to come, to gather, or pray as Paul did in Ephesians 3. He offered a prayer for the Ephesians, and I'm going to read this one. He says, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom His whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, we have power together with all the saints to grasp 
How wide, how long, high, and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What a beautiful prayer. Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work in us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You can pray the Scriptures. And that's what they did. Pray the Scriptures. They not only prayed the Scriptures, they prayed the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven. They, they prayed not only the Lord's Prayer, they prayed their own prayers. They prayed for one another. They prayed for needs. They prayed for opportunities to share the gospel. They prayed to, because what happens when we pray, there is something that happens. It, it, it's, it's, it's natural. It should be natural for a believer in Jesus. Just like, just like water uh, is for flowers and brings it life, there is something about prayer life that, that brings life into us. And unlike water, which can kill a plant, you can't kill yourself by drinking too much prayer, okay? There's just not, you can't do that. And without the prayer, we wilt spiritually inside. It's part of that life that flows out of us. And it brings us into the presence of God. Through prayer, we commune with God. Through prayer, we come to know Him. Through prayer, we submit our wills to Him. Through prayer, we are strengthened and empowered. Through prayer, we confess our sins and we find forgiveness. Through prayer, we find assurance, comfort, strength, hope, grace, and mercy in our time of needs. Through prayer, we bind our hearts together as we seek God's face. Through prayer, we lift one another up and we offer up our prayers and our petitions to the one who knows our needs even before we speak them. We come to our Abba Father. And it's not just something that the person leading prayer does. Prayer is a team sport. It's something that we are all to do. We're all to participate. We're to be active, not passive. It requires participation. And through prayer, we are empowered and emboldened to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. And I want this for us. The early church was devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayer. And amazing things happen. God moved powerfully in their midst. You know, people today have gotten tired of church, but they're hungry for God. So people have gotten hurt in church and have walked away, and they haven't given up on their faith in Christ, but people are looking for something real, something genuine, something true. People want to experience this God who is transcendent, who is holy other. He is creator, we are creation. He is holy, we are fallible sinners. They want to know this transcendent God who has made himself personal and real in Jesus Christ, who has come close to us. Isn't that an amazing thing? That the omnipotent God of the universe has made himself known through the person of Jesus. And that we couldn't approach the omnipotent God on our own, so the omnipotent God came to us, and now through Jesus we can approach the omnipotent God. People came to faith in Jesus. Disciples were being made. God added daily to their number those who were being saved. I want you to know the mission of Jesus continues today, and he uses his church and I pray that we, through his glorious resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit, will be a dream church. That we will be devoted to the teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. That we will see awe and be filled with awe as we see God move in our midst in the things that he does. And that we'll see people who will experience the, the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what I thought? Why dream it when we can live it? This is, this is our birthright. This is our inheritance. So why dream it when we can live it? Amen and amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and I thank you for this beautiful portrait in the early church. 
thank you for their devotion to the teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And God, again, it wasn't forced. It wasn't micromanaged. It was just something that happened because of what you had done for them. And I pray that our church here at Grace, that we, in our hearts, we would experience the same thing. And that as an outflow of that life-giving life that you give us, that we will be devoted. We will be devoted to the teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayer. May we be filled with awe and wonder at the good things that you do for us. May we see people come to faith in Christ. May we see lives changed and transformed. And God, as you fit, see fit, you add daily to the number of those who are being saved. Father, we want that here at Grace in greater measure. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.